G'day guys, welcome back to the Football Come Down. After a brief intermission of five weeks while I was in the States, I am back in England. And so this show returns, a show where we review the round of football as it happens. And a uh, big part of this is getting you guys to comment your thoughts to be included in the video. Now, didn't get a lot of responses this week, so I'll keep this episode pretty short and sharp. I put that down to stopping the show for five weeks. So we'll go through the comments that are here and go through my thoughts on each individual game. I'm also jet lagged as a dog. Jet lagged as a dog. Extremely jet lagged at the moment and also sick as a dog. That's what I was going for. Full of the flu at the moment, um, but this poor content creator must work on his sick days. So let's start off with the first game of the round where the Adelaide Crows bamboozled both my footy tipping and the power with their third consecutive upset showdown victory. This is uh, becoming a habit for the Crows. And what's becoming a habit for the power, to some extent, is their sloppiness in front of goal. They kicked two goals, 14 after quarter time in this game. It's continued, maybe not a, a regular trend throughout this year, but there's been plenty of games where Port Adelaide should have won if they had kicked their expected score. It's another game where they won the inside 50s, and it's another game where they were terrible in front of goal, kicking five goals, 18 in this particular game, and it's cost them the game overall. I mean, they, they still lost by five goals, so it's probably a little bit remiss to say Port Adelaide should have won this game if they kicked better. But nonetheless, this is becoming a concerning trend. They've won the scoring shots 23 to 18. They kicked 11 goals, 16 last week. Beat St Kilda by 10 scoring shots. Back to round one, they kicked 16 goals, 24 against West Coast. They lost to Melbourne despite having more scoring shots. They are the second best team in the competition for inside 50 differential, and yet they're still bleeding games. So that's really disappointing, but a fantastic win for the Crows who are just, just keeping their season alive. We saw this Smalls go to work. We saw Saligo win his first showdown medal, I'm going to guess. Uh, 27 possessions, 14 contested. Really solid player. It's nice to see him rewarded. Isaac Rankin was another small player. who I think he kicked three goals in this game, set up a couple of more. And the Crows midfield did well as well. Crouch, Jawson, and Laird also got the job done. So a bit of pressure off the Crows. I think they now move to three and five. And, you know, on my power rankings each week that I do, I've had them flirting with being ruled out of the finals. But they've come good. They've beaten Carlton. They've beaten North and now claimed another big scalp in Port Adelaide. So a very good victory, a very good victory. We've got a comment here from El Vialador who says Adelaide's defense has been pretty good considering it has six players who combined have seven more games than Charlie Dixon with two first choice players out. Absolutely agree. Not saying they're the comp's best, but definitely punching above their weight class. Agreed. I think... Uh, you know, I did an analysis of every team going into season 2024 and I highlighted Adelaide's on paper backline as being a headache for them as well with um, an ACL to Nick Murray. But overall, it's performing well. Josh Worrell in particular is another guy that I think deserves a lot of credit. I think Michael Annie's having a great season as well. I think Keane has also continued to improve. I would agree with that. Who's, who knows to what extent Adelaide can salvage their season from here? Let's move on to the Carlton-Collingwood game. Another big rivalry game, of course, and it ended in dramatic fashion with Dacos kicking a late winner. 32 possessions, 16 contested, 7 tackles, 7 clearances, 6 inside 50s, 626 metres gained. This is a very complete performance from Nick Dacos, and I did look it up. And interestingly as well, he played more time in the midfield in this game than any time this season. And uh, I should have checked last year, but it might be his most centre bounces attended he's ever had. He attended 89% of center bounces, which I think was up there with any Collingwood player. Might be a byproduct of Dugowie and Tom Mitchell not playing, but Collingwood were just brilliant in this game with their pressure. They laid 34 more tackles. That is an absolute smashing and had 23 extra inside 50s than Carlton in this game. Carlton had more of the ball. They w took more marks around the ground. They lost the clearances 44 to 40, which is generally a strength of Carlton, their stoppage game. 54 to 88 tackles is absolutely insane. It was 22 tackles inside 50 to nine. So just a very interesting stats profile for a game that was very, very close in the end. On the other hand though, Collingwood gave them an absolute bath in inside 50, 64 to 38. So Collingwood playing a manic style, getting a lot of ball inside 50. Could they be more efficient? Possibly. But it's very interesting to consider that Collingwood even with this win and, you know, the last five games, which has only seen one draw and four wins, they still bottom four in, its, in the competition for total possession. While I say inefficient, I mean the scoring inefficiency, like you generate 26 more inside 50s and only win by a goal. Inefficient from that point of view, but efficient with their ball use and the fact that they're not getting a lot of their hands on the footy, but they're making it count. So a very big win here in the context of the season and in typical Collingwood fashion, they <laughs> leave it to the last gasp. Now we'll move on to the Sydney Derby or Derby, but the Swans won this game by five 
five goals, big statement win because this is a you know relative top of the table clash. I think it was second versus third going into this game. It was a slow start for the Swans. I think uh, the Green got an injury of the Tom variety that is an ankle injury, which hurt my fantasy, but also probably had an impact in this game, but I do think Sydney would have won anyway, considering the second half, they really steamrolled them. Very, very wet game. I uh, watched this late at night in America, I believe, and, um, you know, there's a lot being said about Errol Goulton playing in the wet, and there was that pickup that he did. In those conditions, to be as clean as he was, his ball use was good as well. 29 possessions and a goal. He was fantastic. Isaac Heaney as well. I mean, a lot's been said of this guy, and he might be the best player in the competition across the first eight games of this year. He's the first player in 33 years to record 20 plus possessions and a goal in eight consecutive games to start the year. That's wild. The Swans had a number of individuals do well. Grundy was dominant as well. 19 touches, 35 hitouts. Haywood kicked four goals and the inside 50 count was 67 to 42. So Sydney recorded a pretty comprehensive win statistically. 43 to 31 clearances. Again, Tom Green out doesn't help. And the green of the Toby variety uh, was held goalless in a Sydney derby for the first time since 2016. Got a few headaches here. Like I said, Tom Green injury and I think Cal Brown was given three weeks for that bump. So there's going to be a bit of personnel shifting. Hopefully Tom Green Green's all right. Cleared of any structural damage, but either way, this is a big win for the Sydney Swans. St Kilda were too good for North by 38 points. Uh, what was my takeaway from this game? I think it was an interesting game to see so many of the best players in this game uh, be quite young, and both of these sides have quite young players. Now, St Kilda on average might not be that young because they do have a pretty balanced list, and North and Melbourne do not. They have a lot of young players in that team, so naturally their best performance were young, but St Kilda's youth also played well in this game, and that, from that point of view, I found it quite entertaining. Probably the best young player on the field. Maybe that's a big call. There was a few good ones, but Darcy Wilson obviously putting his hand out for the Rising Star. In fact, Dylan Crosby uh, makes the comment, Darcy Wilson gives Reid someone to think about in the Rising Star race. I'd have to agree with that. I mean, it depends how it's going to be adjudged. I really don't know how consistent Reid and Wilson are going to be for the rest of the year. But Darcy Wilson probably emerges as the second favorite at the moment. In fact, that is accurate. I looked it up. But three goals and 21 possessions, shown an ability to hit the scoreboard and also do it in big moments as well. So I think the Saints definitely have a player here in Darcy Wilson. But even North's best players this week were very good in George Wardlaw. One goal and 22 possessions, probably one of the best performances I've seen George Wardlaw have at AFL level. We saw McKercher have 30 touches. We already know Harry Sheasel's a star. And I watched him be interviewed by Dwayne Russell on SEN, I think it was, and didn't realize how much of a quality young man and speaker that guy is and you can really see why he's in the leadership group. Big win for them as well. Aiden Cord did a great job on Max King. Uh, we know the discussion around North Melbourne's defense and that that was an important win for them to have. But I am focusing on North here when, uh, you know, uh, even for the St Kilda, we saw youngsters like Windhager have 25 touches, eight tackles, six clearances, six score involvements. We know Wangaline Miller is already a star, but he was also one of their better contributors and Jack Sinclair had 33 touches and two goals. But yeah, so struggling St Kilda over a winless North Melbourne, you know, on paper doesn't have necessarily any big headlines, but I thought it was encouraging to see the individuals who perform well in this game. Then we had probably the biggest game of the round. It's hard to say. There was a few big ones, the rivalry clashes, Carlton Collingwood up there, but Melbourne and Geelong is another big clash from this game. And the result also makes it particularly interesting with Melbourne getting the job done, which I did not call. I thought Geelong would be too good for them. And it was a very dour, classic football game. When I say classic, I mean, you've got to be a bit of footy purist to have really enjoyed it when no team scored a goal in the second quarter, but I must say I kind of like these kind of games. 14 consecutive behinds were scored between these two sides between the first, second, and third terms. That was obviously covering the quarter where nobody kicked a goal. But Melbourne in the defense first system, both of these sides are kind of defense first teams, uh, were too good. And Jake Lever was probably among the best for them. Stephen May was also very good in this game. And, and Tom Hawkins, gold is for a fourth straight match. Is that is that correct? That is actually obscene. And Diesel Power makes the comment, Tom Hawkins has turned 36 all of a sudden. I mean, yeah, that's true. And that is a, a rare streak of goalless games I'd never thought I'd see Tom Hawkins have. I do think, you know, as a, as a football supporting community, we are quick to judge the veterans who have a, a down run of form and assume it's because they're too old. I'm not saying you're wrong, Diesel Power, but I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Hawkins comes back in a big way. But I, like I said, I think the, the game was won with their defense in this game. May and Lever were fantastic. Mac Gorn was fantastic as well. Petrarca and Oliver. Oliver had 31 touches. That must be up there 
for one of his better games this year for sure. Fritsch kicked three goals in a dour game. For the Cats, this was frustrating as well to lose Tanner Brun to injury. I think his clearance work has been pretty encouraging over the last few weeks. And they also had some usual contributors like Zach Guthrie, who's having an underrated season this year, I have to think. Tom Atkins laid something like 11 tackles in this game. And Ollie Henry is 10th in the Coleman, kicked three goals in this game. So nothing too shocking about some of the best contributors in this game. Uh, the biggest storyline is the fact that the Demons got four points that many didn't expect them to get. So they certainly bounced back into premiership calculations. Then West Coast went down narrowly to Essendon at Optus Stadium on Saturday nights in a game that lived up to expectation, or at least my expectation that it would be a good game. First close game West Coast has been involved in this year. Essendon too good. And, um, you know, not to sound patronizing, but I did think that this would be an important test for Essendon, not because West Coast are necessarily a tough opposition, but I think most reasonable Western fans would concede that sometimes when Essendon has looked good in the past, they've let themselves down at a hurdle that they shouldn't be falling at. And I thought this presented as a danger game for them, even though they are clearly better than West Coast. And it nearly went that way, but I think West Coast fought really hard back into this game, while Essendon dominated a lot of the key stats. So I, long story short, I think Essendon, this is an important four points for them. And I think that is demonstrated by Zach Merritt's celebration at the final siren. They're now five wins, two losses, and one draw, and they deserve credit for that. I think Brad Scott's doing a good job. Uh, in terms of individuals, Zach Merritt played one of his best games this year. Three goals, 29 possessions. I thought Sam Durham did a really good job. I think he played on Harley Reid, but he had 25 touches and seven clearances himself, and Nick Martin was fantastic, particularly in that last quarter. The Eagles had 15 inside 50s in the last term, and Martin had five of his 10 intercept possessions in the last quarter, which shows his impact late in the game. But Essendon did dominate in terms of getting the ball inside 50, 66 to 43. If I had one knock on Essendon this year, it's the fact that they sit, you know, with just two losses this year, and their percentage is 95%, and that demonstrates an inability to really put the foot down. They've had two losses against Sydney and Port, two losses that you'd expect them to have. The next thing they need to work on is, is putting teams away, which they could have done in this game, no doubt. We'll get to the comments, which are mostly West Coast focused. Jake Waterman playing all Australian caliber footy. I have to agree with that. Like, I think he's been one of the happiest storylines of this year. Non-West Coast fans might not be aware that he had a career-threatening illness halfway through last year and has probably been our second best player this year. So hats off to Jake Waterman, who is now out for a couple of weeks, unfortunately. AFL Snap says, Jamie Cripps cost the game. Um, yeah, so he did a very dumb thing and pushed Nick Martin while Jake Waterman was having a shot at goal, which could have, you know, potentially decided the game. But like I said, I think the right team won on dominance. But West Coast were courageous considering they didn't have much of a bench at the end. We then have two conflicting comments about Harley Reid. Luke008 says Harley Reid fended off two players at once. And Meekrob says Harley Reid getting shut down. Yeah, Reid has shown that he has mastered the art of fend-offs. I think, you know, his strength as an individual for an, for an 18-year-old is ridiculous. And I didn't expect him to be good at it at AFL level. As for him getting shut down, I mean, the kid's 18. So that's going to happen. If you were expecting Harley Reid to dominate every week, I think you need to lower your expectations. Sure, I think uh, Sam Durham... I think it was Sam Durham who played on him, did a pretty good job of throwing him off and, and beating his man for sure. But Harley Reid also laid five tackles, 14 touches, and I don't think that's a terrible performance. Let's talk about Richmond and Fremantle at the MCG with Fremantle bullying in the end to win by 54 points. Their midfield was very, very impressive against a depleted midfield, absolutely, and obviously missing a few soldiers and probably not a strong midfield to begin with. But nonetheless, Fremantle's midfield is very, very good. Caleb Zerong is potentially uh, a shout out for the Brownlow this year. I definitely reckon that. Andrew Brayshaw also contributing well, and Hayden Young, possibly the best of the three in this particular game. But Fremantle are the number one team for clearance this year, uh, alongside Essendon in second, I think, and they won 20 more clearance than their opposition this game. Luke Ryan was fantastic, 39 disposals. He was absolutely dominant. Josh Tracy also having a good run of form. I think he kicked four goals in this game and showing what happens when you persevere with a young talent and are patient. He, he looks like a very rock solid talent. Is there much more to analyze from this game? I'm, I'm not too sure. Other than the Fremantle, you know, Showing that they're far too good for Richmond, um, I do think that is going to be the trend. I think Richmond's going to struggle from here onwards. But they backed up a good performance last week, and maybe that's something Fremantle's lacked in the past, is having a good win and then maybe not showing up the next week. Uh, Graz Best Clips says, Dockers will finish top four, Sarong Brownlow and Josh Tracy top five in the Coleman. Uh, for those unaware, I think... Graz is being a little bit facetious here, but Fremantle could play finals. Sarong could win the Brownlow. I do think there is a chance of that. He's been fantastic, and we have seen those inside bull clearance midfielders generally rank high in the Brownlow. So I, I'd, I'd keep an eye on that for sure. Josh Tracy, top five in the Coleman, is laughable. <laughs> 
Second last game was the Bulldogs losing to Hawthorne. This uh, this one sent a bit of a ripple around the AFL because Beveridge, the pressure on him at the moment will be ramping up and probably rightfully so. This is a game they shouldn't have lost um, on paper. No disrespect to Hawthorne. I thought they played really well. It looked like they'd responded after their loss to Fremantle last week, um, which, you know, is no disgrace losing to Fremantle in Perth. Uh, and they keep the first three goals in this game and look like, you know, the good version of the Western Bulldogs was on before Hawthorne started to slowly take control. And uh, again, it was a case of the dogs dominating clearances, but Hawthorne having more inside 50s, more disposals, and out tackling them. Big shout out to James Sicily. Very good captain's game in this game. Not only did he play well and kick the winner and go forward and, and do James Sicily things, but he also, I think he dislocated his shoulder early in this game. It's a great win for Hawthorne, especially when you consider, I know preseason is just preseason, but. I think the Bulldogs smashed them twice. And you fast forward to round eight and Hawthorne get the job done. Connor McDonald kicked three goals. Jai Newcomb was really good in the midfield. And it's a nice little run of form for them. Their wins admittedly were against North and now the Bulldogs. But either way, we're seeing that slow growth from Hawthorne. They started the year slowly last year, then came good. And they're, they're starting to replicate that a little bit. Things are a little bit dire for the Western Bulldogs at the moment. And I, when I say dire, I just mean not living up to the expectation and the quality of the list that they have. And I think I might actually do a video on the Western Bulldogs this week. So let me know in the comments if you want me to take a look a little bit closer at what's happening there. Tom Liberatore's concussion thing is really concerning. So I think he collapsed against, uh, was it Essendon a few weeks ago, missed a week, came back in and then suffered another concussion. Now he's out indefinitely. So all I have to say about that is, you know, that's a little bit sickening and I really hope we see Liberatore back soon and his long-term health as well. Um, but even in terms of football, like he was, I think he's number two in the league for clearances this year. So it's a big blow for the Western Bulldogs from, on many fronts. And finally, the Q clash, Brisbane Lions, despite having an injury crisis, both before and during this game, got the job done um, with the help of a few youngsters also stepping up to fill the void. So Stasevich was ruled out at the start of the game um, due, due to a calf injury in the warm-up. What else we have? We had McCarthy and Gardner. I'm not sure if they're confirmed ACL or suspected ACL, but that's dire. That is really bad. And Noah Answorth with a concussion as well. So things really went against Brisbane this game and they came good and were able to jag a win. So there's probably two main narratives from this game. Brisbane did well and showed some resilience and also had a number of young players players play well in this game. Logan Morris is one that comes to mind. Kai Lobman played well. Bruce Revel was good on debut as well. So this is the first time Brisbane's depth, depth might have been exposed for a, a number of years. They've been historically a good injury list team, if that makes sense. So now we'll see to the extent to which the list can handle it. But, you know, a good start. For me, not to take too much of the gloss off Brisbane here, but I think this is a horrific result for the Gold Coast Suns. I think they've just shown this bipolarness this season where their best is very good and they're a little bit flat track bullyish this year. And this was a perfect opportunity to, you know, jag a win against an up and down Brisbane Lions side who had injuries. Poor start to the game again. I don't think they've been, you know, pretty good away from home in opening quarters. It was five goals, five um, against this week. And you just look at the stat sheet and the number one clearance player in the league, Matthew Rao, was kept to just two clearances this week. And they were left a little bit exposed, bearing in mind as well, Brisbane are a pretty good clearance side. Corey Blackledge says, Gold Coast were overhyped in the preseason to make finals and now they won't finish in the top 10 with the easiest draw. I'm not too sure if I I personally saw so much Gold Coast Finals hype. I do think in pockets there was that preseason belief. Um, that being said, they probably haven't looked as good as I'd hoped. But the thing is, their best football has looked pretty compelling, but then they play a half-decent team, particularly away from home, and they haven't even really got close. Their wins this year were Richmond, Adelaide, West Coast, and Hawthorne. And that's fine. It's fine to just beat the teams below you and lose to the teams above you. That kind of just makes logical sense, but they've looked quite poor against the teams well above them. It might be just the byproduct of a young best 22, maybe not a young list, but a young best 22, where a lot of their best contributors are young and are likely to be inconsistent. But either way, not a great result. Anyway, guys, that is my take on round eight. Uh, stay tuned for just the tips, which should be out either today or tomorrow, depending on when I upload this. But let me know in the comments what you thought of this round, then I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.